Hello and welcome to the Embedded C Programming Design Patterns course. This course is available here on YouTube. And also, if you don't want to wait until the next module comes out, you can get this course as a book, as book plus videos, Udemy course, and also all of the book and video content, as well as live sessions with me on Wednesdays, which is available at SwedishEmbedded.com. So the book is available on Kindle. You can download it uh, from Amazon. The Udemy course contains the book materials as uh, resources, as PDFs here. And on the website, we have the course available as a standalone course uh, directly on the website. You just click join here, enter your details, register as a student, and then you will have access to all the course materials and also the weekly Q&A, which is uh, in five days, eight hours at the time when I'm recording this. All right, so let's get on with the next module of this course. Hello and welcome to another module of the Design Patterns Training at Swedish Embedded. My name is Martin Schroeder and if you have any questions uh, regarding this training, you can join our Discord channel. You will find the link at swedishembedded.com or if you have any questions you want to ask me directly, you can always email me at martin.schroeder at swedishembedded.com. In this pattern, we are going to look at the semaphore and uh, when we use a semaphore, why we want to use it, and how it builds on the previous pattern that we discussed, which was the spin lock, and how it allows um, us to unblock arbitrary threads, how, and how we can signal from, for example, an interrupt handler to another thread. Some of the defining characteristics of the semaphore is that we have the give and take functions. So we can give the semaphore, make it available, and we can take it, which means that it's not available. And we can also have a counter, which uh, can have an arbitrary integer, integer value. So we can take the semaphore multiple times before it becomes unavailable. The semaphore is the first uh, design pattern in the concurrency section that is aware of existence of other threads. So as we remember from the spin lock pattern, it was not thread aware, but the semaphore is the first pattern we are looking at, which actually is thread aware. And it maintains a thread queue internally, allowing it to have multiple threads that actually wait for the semaphore to become available. And then when it becomes available, it can then unblock uh, one of those threads. The main use cases of the semaphore is uh, signaling from an interrupt handler. So this is the first pattern which allows us to uh, unblock a thread that is waiting for something to happen. But let's say we have an event uh, in, in the interrupt handler, uh, an event that triggers an interrupt handler, um, and uh, we want to signal that thread that uh, something has occurred. So we can give the semaphore from an interrupt handler and then the thread will become unblocked as long as it's waiting for the same semaphore and it can continue. It is also used for signaling between threads. So uh, a semaphore is usually uh, given in one thread or an interrupt and then taken in another thread. So it's very rare that you uh, both take and give the semaphore in the same thread because it doesn't really make sense. And number three is um, we can use the semaphore to wake up multiple threads in sequence. Now it's worth noting that when we give a semaphore, we can only wake up one thread at a time atomically. So we cannot uh, unblock multiple threads and then uh, let the system decide which one to schedule. We have to unblock one thread at a time. So uh, the semaphore uh, is only taking one thread from the queue and then uh, the function returns as opposed to, for example, a conditional variable that has the ability to wake up multiple threads at the same time. The benefits of the semaphore compared to other uh, concurrency design patterns is that it's very lightweight. It's uh, pretty much almost at the level of uh, the spin lock, but with the addition of thread awareness. So it's still very lightweight. And it's the only uh, synchronization, the only thread aware synchronization primitive that is um, usable from interrupt handlers. So if we want to signal from an interrupt handler, the semaphore is our only way to do that. We cannot use a mutex in an interrupt handler, for example. The drawbacks of the semaphore involve uh, no priority boosting. So um, for example, with a mutex, we can have multiple threads waiting on a mutex. And if another new thread comes in and waits for the mutex and 
a lower priority thread is currently holding the mutex, then the lower priority thread will automatically get um, increased priority level so that it can complete faster. But the semaphore doesn't have this. Um, and it's uh, this is why we don't use a semaphore in place of a mutex, even though technically we can do that, but uh, it doesn't have this ability to boost priorities, which means that uh, if the higher priority thread tries to take a semaphore uh, that is um, uh, that is currently, or we never even talk about the semaphore as being held by a thread, but let's say we are waiting on a semaphore and then we're waiting for a lower priority thread to give the semaphore, there wouldn't be any kind of boost in priority for the low priority thread uh, to make it complete um, uh, at an increased priority, so our higher priority thread will essentially just uh, keep waiting for some low priority task to finish. Um, and number two, we um, we cannot really use, um, yeah, and basically this is a consequence of uh, point number one, is that we cannot use the semaphore for mutual exclusion as, as we can do with the mutex. Okay, so how do we actually implement this? First of all, let's have a look at some code that uh, shows us a typical use case for a semaphore. So we have one function, which is which can, can be either an uh, interrupt handler or another thread. And we have another function here that uh, tries to take the semaphore. So we initialize the semaphore, and then when we get here, then this uh, thread that is executing this function is going to be placed at the queue of the semaphore um, in the inside the internal queue, and um, it will wait, like provided that the semaphore is not available, it will wait for the semaphore to be given. And then when an interrupt occurs or another thread gets to run and it gives the semaphore here, then this function will actually swap in the waiting thread and we will actually continue here. So this is the beauty of semaphores. We can have we can give a semaphore in, in an interrupt handler and actually if, if it's an interrupt handler then of course the scheduling will be delayed until the interrupt completes. But uh, the, the key point to notice here is that when we give a semaphore we have actual ability to uh, switch context directly to the thread that is waiting for that semaphore. So in this way we can um, we can have full control over where we jump in the code and we have the ability to jump in mul between multiple places in the code, which is very powerful. So let's look at the implementation of the semaphore give function and then we'll look at the implementation of the semaphore take function. So in the give function, we, we use a spin lock to, to guard the internals of the semaphore as a way of uh, implementing mutual, uh, mutual exclusion with interrupts. So we have uh, we we grab the spin lock, and uh, then we grab the first thread in the queue, and this queue, the wait queue, at least in Zephyr, and usually this is how it's supposed to be implemented. This wait queue is um, sorted by priority already. So when we take the first thread from the queue, we get the highest priority thread that is ready to run. So uh, we grab that thread. If the thread is not zero, then uh, we uh, basically mark the thread as ready so that the thread can be scheduled in. If the thread is, uh, if there is no thread, then we mark the semaphore as being available. So we increase the count and uh, then we call the handling of poll events so that if there is any polling going on for, for waiting for some events uh, on the semaphore, then uh, this, um, uh, this call will basically emit those events. And uh, then we call reschedule. So uh, if we have any thread that became uh, unblocked uh, during this operation here, then we uh, call reschedule and we pend a, a new reschedule of uh, a new run of the scheduler that will basically swap in that thread. And one important thing to notice here is that we're actually passing this lock to the reschedule. So we are grabbing the lock here, but then we are not giving it back until reschedule has finished. And this is important. And the reason we need to pass this into reschedule is because uh, we cannot uh, give the lock after reschedule because then it would be wrong since uh, reschedule actually um, can actually switch context to, to the new thread. So we need to let reschedule actually unblock this uh, spin lock for us. So we do this and we ensure that all of this code is um, executed as part of the critical section until the reschedule has completed. Now let's move on to the, the semaphore take function. So the semaphore take function uh, basically asserts that if like either we are 
not in an interrupt or if we are in an interrupt then we need to make sure that the timeout is set to no wait because it doesn't make sense to sleep uh, in an interrupt handler it's actually invalid so we need to check this so if we want to take a semaphore from an interrupt handler we need to make sure that we call uh, the the same take function with uh, a timeout that is that is basically no wait so no timeout then we grab the spin lock exactly the same as uh, in the semaphore give function and uh, we check the count. If it is available, uh, then we decrease the count and we unlock the spin lock. And then we go to the, uh, then we just return. So basically the semaphore is available. So we, we don't need to uh, queue the current thread uh, to wait for the semaphore. So if the semaphore is available, the operation is very simple. We're just um, establishing a critical section here. We decrease the count. So now we are synchronized with interrupts properly. And then we just return. If the semaphore is not available, then uh, we um, basically check that if the timeout is set to any value other than no wait. So if it's no wait, then we then we still return. But if it's <coughs> if it's set to any value other than no wait, then we return. Um, let's see. If it is set to no wait, then we return e busy. But if it's any value other than no wait, then we pend the current thread uh, with this timeout on the semaphore wait queue and basically what this does is uh, it marks the current thread as sleeping and the thread is then added to the wait queue and it waits until the semaphore is unblocked using the give function so uh, next time when the semaphore becomes unblocked then we get this thread using this call here we get the thread and then we unblock the thread and we reschedule so this is the basic concept of the semaphore and uh, you can see how it's uh, used to control the scheduling of different threads and in this way we can queue a thread and then wake it up and switch context to the to the thread that has been wake, uh, awakened and we can continue wherever that thread was executing before it uh, tried to take the semaphore so a few things to to note here is that uh, if we initialize the semaphore to zero with a maximum count of one, then this means we have uh, zero resources available at the beginning. So now we are waiting, next time we try to take the semaphore, it's gonna basically queue the thread. So we're gonna have to wait until the semaphore is given. If we initialize it to one from the start, then uh, the semaphore is available. So the first uh, call to semaphore take is gonna basically complete right away. And if we set the semaphore to count two, then we can take it twice before it becomes blocked. So essentially we can, we can use the semaphore to control how many items we have available or how many threads are allowed to continue without blocking. The best practices for using a semaphore is that we always, number one, is that we always uh, give it in one thread and take it in another thread. It's not, a, it's not a hard requirement that we have to do it this way, but this is what it was designed to do. And uh, this is uh, the main use case for the semaphore, where we signal from one thread to another. And, this, and the semaphore compared to mutex, for example, mutex disallows uh, uh, taking the mutex in one thread and then unblocking it in another thread. Whereas the semaphore explicitly allows this, so it's, it's the pattern that we should use when we have this scenario. We use the semaphore for um, resource management and we should avoid circular, circular dependencies uh, where we have multiple semaphores that we need to take. So we need to always lock the semaphores in one order and unlock them in reverse order. If we do anything else, then we run the risk of creating a deadlock because if we have two threads, one of them is waiting for a semaphore that another one holds and uh, while still holding a semaphore that the other one needs. Uh, in that situation, both threads are locked and ne neither of them can continue. Um, because they're both waiting for each other to in order to continue. So we want to avoid that kind of situation. And the common pitfalls of using the semaphore pattern is that we can get a priority inver inversion uh, where we have uh, a thread waiting for a semaphore that is given by some task that is low priority. So we need to be aware of this. Um, and uh, number two is the deadlock situation where we have two threads waiting for uh, each other's semaphores. And uh, the last situation uh, that we need to watch out for is if we never give the semaphore. So for example, quite common if you have a very complex operation done in an interrupt somewhere, 
then maybe you're giving the semaphore most of the time, but maybe there is some error case where you forget to give the semaphore. In that case, the whatever thread is waiting for the semaphore is never going to continue. And uh, you will get a situation where you maybe lose some data or something, some other weird result happens. And those situations are difficult to debug. So you have to be very attentive that uh, whatever semaphore you are waiting for, you have to be very sure exactly where you're giving that semaphore and making sure that you always give that semaphore, regardless whether you have a success or an error. There are two main alternatives to semaphores that are also thread aware, which is the conditional variables and mutexes. But the use cases are different. So conditional variables variables are used for custom data that um, that describes some event that happened. So we can wait for a certain condition to happen. We can have complex conditions where we're waiting for many different things to, to become true before we can continue. So that's something that we use conditional variables for. We'll describe conditional variables in, in coming modules. And mutexes is also another thread aware primitive, but we don't use it for signaling. In fact, it cannot be used for signaling. The primary use for mutexes is uh, mutual exclusion. So uh, those two alternatives, they, they kind of don't fit into the use case of the semaphore anyway. So, so just like with the spin lock, the semaphore fi fits its particular purpose of signaling uh, from the interrupt handler primarily to the thread context. And then all the other primitives that we're going to discuss, they're going to be dealing only with threads. So they don't uh, deal with interrupts at all. So we've looked at the semaphore pattern. We, we have started with a spin lock, which was uh, helping us to synchronize between uh, hardware. And now uh, the semaphore helps us to take the message from interrupts into the thread context. And now we are ready to implement more complex primitives that, uh, that allow us uh, to, do, to do mutual exclusion between threads only. Let's check your understanding of this pattern. So how does the semaphore ensure that giving a semaphore in one thread directly makes the processor end up um, at the end of the call to the semaphore take function of another thread? Why is the semaphore count not incremented if there are threads waiting for the semaphore to become available? What does the count actually re represent? So if you remember the implementation, the, the counter is not uh, incremented if there are threads waiting. So why is that? How does the semaphore differ from a spin lock? How does the semaphore differ from, from a mutex? Why should uh, a semaphore never be used for mutual exclusion in place of a mutex? So you can use it for mutual exclusion. It's technically allowed uh, and it, it would actually work. But why shouldn't you use it for mutual exclusion? What thread will be scheduled to run first when multiple threads are waiting for a semaphore and the semaphore is given by another thread or an interrupt? So which, which thread is going to run? What does a, when does the CPU switch to the awakened thread when a semaphore is given from an interrupt handler? So let's say you're executing an interrupt handler and then you execute the semaphore give function and that unblocks a thread, but when will that thread run? So that's it for this module. I hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next module where we're going to discuss the mutex concept.